So welcome. This is FUC, a, uh, a weekly online speaker series facilitated by Rent Burden students at the at UC Irvine in solidarity with the UC wide cost of um, living adjustment or COLA movement. I'm Thomas Williams, a PhD candidate in English at UC Irvine, and my facilitator, Molly Threlkill, is a PhD candidate in visual studies at so our mission with this series is to both widen the visibility of the COLA movement at the University of California, but also to create a space for conversations around labor and labor movements, as well as the future of higher education and the university. For more information and to see recordings of our previous talks, please visit our website at fuc-series.org or contact us at cola or perish at gmail.com. So Molly and I also want to note that we view our role as facilitators as just that. We are here to provide our energy and resources to grow this platform so that these conversations and inviting discussions can take place. Above all, we are here to listen and to learn alongside everyone. So to that end, um, we wish to kind of push a couple of things today. The first is the UC boycott, which is a call of conscience not to speak at any University of California campuses until the administration reinstates all graduate students fight for strike activities and that the administration vows that there will be no subsequent retaliation again either against individual students or against their respective departments and there should be a link in the chat to sign up there. We will be holding a panel discussion around the boycott including um, guest speaker Lauren Ballant um, at the same time um, two weeks today that's 12 to 1 p.m. on um, the 7th of August, on, kind of, on Friday the 7th. So the signatories should not give guest, guest lectures or provide public speak, speeches, either remotely or in person at the University of California. We invite all signatories to reflect on other forms of protest and boycott they might um, employ. The second um, is a request for you to give some people your money. So um, it's the UCSC Wildcat Strike Fund, it's almost all gone um, and almost, almost all been spent. Please remember that there are 41 workers yet to be reinstated and they are dependent on donations like this um, to, be able to, to be able to live, basically. So if you have the means, please do donate um, as, kind of as much as you are able. So just to now introduce our speaker for today, um, we are very grateful to be joined by Malcolm Harris, a freelance writer and author of Shit is Fucked Up and Bullshit, History Since the End of History, um, and Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials. His work has appeared in the New Republic, Book Forum, The Village Voice, N Plus One, and the New York Times Magazine. He lives in Philadelphia, and today he will be presenting Human Capital Stock. And so over to you, Malcolm. Great. And thanks so much for having me, Thomas and Molly. I want to ask people again, please donate to that fund. Uh, if you're not the people who are being supported by the fund, and if you're the people who are being supported by the fund, thank you. Uh, and we support you by donating to the fund. Uh, I'm really excited to have the chance to talk with you all today. I'm not a professor, so I don't get to like give lectures about some ideas I have all the time. Uh, so this is a, a cool opportunity for me. I think it's gonna be a relevant topic as you'll see both to like the news of literally half an hour ago, as well as the campaign that we're here to support. Um, I've got a, a slideshow that I'll be presenting from that we'll be able to go back and forth a little bit. But let's start there. So this is the, the we talk today, which is fixed variable capital or how Marx explains why you hate yourself and want to die. And that uh, another way of saying human capital, which is a topic that you might have heard a little bit about in the world. Uh, if you like Google human capital, you're going to get this version, which is sort of the neoliberal concept of human capital. They don't have have like a strict def def definition, but it's something like these word clouds. You'll get a lot of word clouds with stuff like knowledge, 
skills, uh, creativity, health even sometimes. They're the skills and the abilities that you put to work when you go to work is how I like to talk about it. Um, Foucault talks about it uh, in terms of the entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialism of the self. We're not going to be looking at the sort of neoliberal version of it because that gets too much discussion and we don't spend enough time on a rigorous conceptualization of what human capital actually means. Um, so this is a circuit you might recognize, uh, which is capital valorization. And we're going to be talking about this part right here. And that's the labor and the means of production, which are together commodity capital, which is what capitalists use their money to buy and then to get together engage in production, producing uh, another commodity that they sell for more money. Uh, so that's the point we're going to be talking about. And these are the, the concepts we're going to be using. So where does it come from? Where does it go? Uh, how does human capital, how do skills enter our production process? We have a couple different models from Marx and Engels, even though they don't really like spend a lot of time on this question. From Engels, unsurprisingly, we have the model of what happens if you're like a rich person from a good family who's investing in your human capital at the family level. And his model is basically a, what we think of as higher education today, right? Which is that you and your family, if you're lucky, invest in your future labor power by giving you skills. And then when you go to the market, you get paid more for your skills because you've invested them than you would have otherwise. You know, you become a doctor and you make more money as a doctor, et cetera, but it compensates, it stays constant relatively. From Marx, we have a different version where he's talking about a human as a machine as part of production. Uh, and this is like pretty, pretty basic stuff when we're talking about production uh, in Marxist terms, but he's basically thinking about it that like, okay, if you need to train your workers to use a machine, you factor in those training costs into the long-term production costs, how much you're going to use that worker over time. Uh, just like you're going to have to be maintaining machinery, you're going to have to be maintaining workers as well. And so if you spend money training workers, you're going to be getting that money back from their labor, but nobody's really profiting from that, right? It's a constant element of production. So here we have a model of how, of those ideas of training. So you've got the angles one where you've got the worker pays and the worker benefits congratulations, you're a doctor. You get the Marx one where capital is like a machine. Uh, you train your worker, you get the benefits of training your worker. But once you have those two categories, you open up the possibility for this uh, uh, non-commensurability. You look for a break here. Um, and this is where, since what we're talking about is ultimately the wage, how much you're getting paid back for things that you're doing, it's an object of disputation. And so you can have situations where, for example, capital pays and the worker benefits. And so example here, you've got the bad apprentice, Ben Franklin, who is part of an apprentice program. You know, his, his boss invests in teaching him how to be a printer, and then he runs away and starts his own business. You know, capital pays, the worker benefits, capital gets shorted. But then you also have the possibility of a situation where the worker pays and capital benefits. Capital doesn't pay them back through the wage for their work. Um, so like an unpaid intern, for example, who comes to the work with training that they already have, if you hire your unpaid intern, well, they've basically just paid to train themselves. You don't have to train them. They're a cheaper work for you, which is basically like how they advertise unpaid internships, right? It's like you'll make yourself into a good deal for an employer. Uh, but that's a form of exploitation. And firms, and this is Gary Becker, so now we're talking about neoliberals who are analyzing uh, human capital from a firm perspective, understands, Gary Becker in the 60s understands, okay, firms are going to want to, over time, shift these costs 
away off their balance books because they don't want to deal with the bad apprentice Ben Franklin. Um, they're going to shift those costs to the workers themselves. Uh, I, I should point out that Engels, when he's talking, uh, suggests what a state socialist system for human capital would look like instead, which is echoed in the movie Barbara by Christian Petzold, if you've ever seen it. And it's really funny. It's, I mean, it's a great movie, but there's a very funny scene. The lead character, Barbara, is this East German doctor, and she's really frustrated, and she wants to emigrate, and she's complaining to the other doctor that, like, what? Okay, so the people of this country paid for my education to turn me into a doctor, and so now, what, I have to, like, stay here my whole life and take care of them? And he's like, yeah, that's how it works. And that was the, the Angles idea, which is that it's still constant, but the state invests and then the state benefits or the people invest and the people benefit um, from human capital. But when capitalists are looking at it, they don't wanna keep things constant. They don't wanna pay for what they get because as we know, that's how you make money as capitalist. Okay, if we wanna have a rigorous understanding of human capital and how it enters the production process, we got to look at it in terms of Marx's categories of commodity capital. And Marx breaks down commodity capital into two sets of binaries, how he categorizes it. Fluid and fixed, and sometimes fluid is referred to as circulating, which is incredibly confusing, and I beg people not to do that ever or to do it as little as possible, use fluid. Fluid and fixed and constant and variable. And so here you see how those breaks down. You've got constant fluid capital, stuff like electricity, uh, water, internet, et cetera, things that get used up in their entirety uh, in, your pro in your production process. You have to renew them as you do it. Fixed constant capital is stuff, stuff like machinery and tools, and they leak their value into production over time. You still have to maintain them, um, but they get used up not, you know, in a day's worth of production in their entirety, but they gotta be amortized over time. Fluid variable capital is living labor, right? You get tired um, every day, you gotta go to sleep, you gotta eat food, you gotta re be reproduced. Um, but what a capital puts in, what you, you get back in a wage is less than what the capitalist is getting out of you, which is surplus value, which is why it's variable, right? Because those the inputs and the outputs uh, don't have a one-to-one -one relation. And this is the, the conventional view of the categories of, human, of commodity capital. But what goes in the fourth category? Where, where we're missing is this early 19th century uh, political economist, I guess you could say, or critique of the political economist. And he's got this essay where he's writing against Mill. And Mill's argument about is this pamphlet where he's saying uh, it's like a, the most basic argument for a defense of capitalists that you've ever seen in your life. It's like, you know, you say capitalists don't do anything, but capitalists have to bring all the stuff to production. You got to bring the machines, you got to bring the clothes, they got to have all the wages ready. They got to prepare everything for production in order for it to happen. And so, of course, they're going to they're going to want some money. And this is this remains the like conventional defense of capitalist profit. And Hodgkin writes this whole response where he's like, the only thing, the only thing necessary for production that gets brought there is the skill of the laborer. Capitalists don't have to have anything. They could just have some credit. They could be lying. Um, we recognize all the time that capitalists don't have this like stock of goods that pays for production into the future. That's not really what capitalists do. And in fact, the only thing that, that you need in terms of like fixed stuff to begin production is a laborer who knows how to do their job. And you can't, you can't get anything without a laborer who knows how to do the thing you need them to do. Uh, and Marx writes a whole critique of this Hodgkin pamphlet, but he does uh, cite in a footnote in Capital this half a fragment of a sentence about the only thing that, which can be said to be stored up or previously prepared uh, to the point of production is the skill of the laborer, right? Um, 
And so that we can understand in this fourth category. And when we start to make understand it that way, it, a lot of things sort of fit together and start to make more sense. Uh, Morgan Adamson, who's, um, uh, she's at McCann. Alistair College right now in his perspective in a way that I think is really valuable. Uh, in this essay about human capital talks about how it collapses the distinction between fixed and variable capital. And I think that's, that's, that's right in a way in that it allows us to find their overlap, right? It's not that these things can't happen in the same place, it's that we haven't thought about how they do overlap, how uh, a worker is like a machine but when we start to think about it that way, it becomes really obvious, right? Because workers don't only get used up by the day. You get used up by the day, but you also get used up by the career, by the lifetime, by the working lifetime, if you're lucky, right? And we see people all the time whose human capital doesn't last their whole working lifetime, who become redundant um, because their skills aren't needed anymore. And that's a, that's a mode of exploitation, right? That's a vector where you can see capitalists able to exploit people as not paying them back for the skills that they've acquired, that they need for production, that capital requires. But the whole point of capital is that it's inalienable, right? You can't sell your skills or abilities. If you could sell your degree from Harvard or whatever, the whole thing would make a lot more sense, then we would be capitalists in this uh, neoliberal way that they talk about. Well, we're all entrepreneurs of the self. We're all investing in ourselves. Well, you can't sell yourself. You can't sell your skills and abilities. Uh, it doesn't work that way. The only thing that you can do is sell your ability to work. And so that's how we access the human capital that's within workers is you put them to work and it leaks out of them slowly uh, like it does out of any other sort of machine. So humans are our sort of production machine, which we already know. And so we need to recognize that there are both fluid and fixed aspects uh, of labor. And so now we can see on the our models of training where constant and variable, we can add a third dimension here and see what the relations are there. So now we can start to get into the world a little bit. Uh, there's a reason this is called, and this is in Milwaukee, there's the Barack Obama School of Career and Technical Education. And this is a, a K through 12 school in Milwaukee. And there's a reason why it's not the Barack Obama School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. And it's because the, the idea that we are training children for work is now a generally accepted truth about education. It wasn't always the case. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, there was a lot of bromides about what kids were doing at school and citizenship and et cetera. And, and within the last 10, 20 years, both parties have dropped that idea. And we're sort of openly declaring that the point of education is this investment in human capital. Right? We'll put, when we send kids to school, we're putting to work their ability to work. And what had been hidden behind what's called the pedagogical mask, and this is, a, this is a concept I've seen people give me credit for, which is very kind of them, but it's not true. It's a German guy named Jürgen Zinnecker, who's not very well translated, uh, but he came up with this idea called pedagogical mask. And what the pedagogical mass says is that when kids are working, what they're working on is building their human capital when kids are learning. And we disguise that work, that productive work, that production of human capital, we disguise it under what's called the pedagogical mask, right? We say, you're learning. You're not working, you're learning. Except sometimes we talk about how they need to work harder, but when it comes down to it, what you're doing under there, what you're doing in school isn't work, you don't need a union, uh, what you're doing is learning. But as the, the public rhetoric has changed um, and human capital production becomes the, the clear goal of school, the, the pedagogy 
pedagogical mass starts to fall. And now you have kids who understand their education as human capital production as well, which uh, is sad. And we'll get to how that affects people psychologically in a little bit. Can workers own the means of production? So now that we've established the existence of this fixed human capital, now we can look for analogs. Is human capital the only kind of fixed variable capital or is there other kinds of fixed capital that workers exploit? Is they, do they find other ways to exploit accumulated labor? And G.A. Cohen talks about this a little bit. Uh, shout out to Tim Barker for pointing me towards this. Thanks, Tim. Uh, G.A. Cohen talks a little bit about workers owning insufficient means of production. So you've got the tailor, this is a, a 16th century tailor right here. He looks very dignified with his, with his scissors. And Cohen talks about, well, if you own your scissors and you bring your scissors to work as a tailor, you know, uh, you can be said to own that means of production, but it, it's insufficient. You can't produce on your own, um, but, but still you can be said to own that pair of scissors. And obviously that pair of scissors is part of the means of production. Uh, you own it. I'm not sure this is true. And I'm gonna or argue that what that scissors looks like is something more like that. Uh, something more like a, a Tim Burton character where the scissors are attached to your hands, right? As far as the boss is concerned, you don't own the scissors, you're Edward Scissors hands. Um, and it sort of goes back to remember, capitalists don't necessarily own anything either, even though they appear to workers as people who own be you, uh, they don't necessarily own anything either. Uh, talk about that in a minute. So this is Ratatouille. You might recognize Ratatouille. Um, and as far as the Ratatouille, if you don't know, is a story about a, a chef who becomes friends with a talking rat and the talking rat is also an excellent chef and he becomes the, the brains behind the, the sous chef's rise as a chef by hiding under his hat. And the thing about the relationship between labor and capital is as capital views you as human capital, they're setting production targets. They don't really care how you get there, right? They don't care if there's a mouse under your hat telling you how to make that soup. It doesn't matter to them if, they, if you own your human capital or if you own the clothes that they tell you to bring to, uh, to work. There's another movie, uh, Abbas Kiarostami's uh, short called uh, A Suit for a Wedding, where there are a bunch of kids who work in this garment district and one of them is making the suit for this rich kid. And all the kids in the garment district wanna borrow the rich kid's suit before he gets it to go out on the town for just like an hour or two, right? And, and capital sort of views you like that. Like, we, it doesn't matter if it's your suit. It doesn't matter if you own the human capital or if you own the tools. Uh, if any of this, this objectified uh, variable fixed capital belongs to you or not. The point is that you can put it to work uh, for capital. So this is a, the new progressive mascot for progressive auto insurance. This is the motor. It's like the minotaur, but it's a motor. And it's a guy who's half guy, half motorcycle. Um, which is always funny because like, who rides on the seat, right? Like what's the point of a motorcycle is a thing that a human rides. And I think the, the implied answer here that they don't say is that you're, you're an Uber driver, right? That's an Uber driver. And that's how companies think of workers in their relationship to human capital, not just their skills and abilities, but any tools they might be required to bring to work is as this, this motor, this collective uh, accumulation of potential labor uh, based on not just your, your living ability to do work, but also the accumulation of your past skills and maybe the accumulation of your past purchases, right? Because you saved up to buy that, that bike. And with this pressure to transfer fixed costs onto workers, we see capital shifting more towards this platform model, right? Where they assume less and less responsibility for their capital assets. And since so much of this 
the market right now is so speculative. And one of the things that they're looking at is capital, capital utilization metrics. A company looks way, way better if they say, oh yeah, we have 10 employees and a billion dollars in revenue. And don't look at the fact that we have 100,000 contract workers who are signed up for our platform because they don't count. And that's sort of true because the company itself isn't responsible for those cars, right? The, the cars come to them as part of the worker. Um, and we see this echo of a sort of putting out system where workers are now responsibility, responsible for handling their own means of production, yeah. for bringing them to the workplace or not bringing them to the workplace as the case may be, as we're seeing now in the age of Zoom. And this is something that Marx considers a little bit as putting out system, but he sort of writes it off. And it's easy to see why. Because one of the examples that he gives is this is uh, watchmaking. The watchmaking is something you can do through a putting out system because it requires uh, really sophisticated labor. It's, it's slow. Um, the pieces are small. It's easier to move them around. And so you don't, and you don't produce a lot of them. And so you don't need this, the centralized benefits that you get from a factory. But as Marx is writing, he's seeing this, this tendency towards the centralization of production in the factory. And the benefits that you get from concentrating production in one place seems so massive that the idea that you're ever going to, you know, put production back in people's houses as like a major part of production seemed really silly to him. late 70s, early 80s to the era of personal computing where individual consumers became responsible for purchasing thousands of dollars of electronics with which to communicate with each other when in the past this had been the, not just the role of the state but the, specifically the military. Um, and now, now it's everyone's job to, to bring our, our computers to work and when they fail, they are our responsibility. So I'm sorry for my responsibility. I'm also sorry for the era in which we find ourselves. Um, but also that, that relates exactly to what I was gonna start talking about, which is where were we, where did I get cut off? Did I get to call Marx did not anticipate the internet? No? Can, I, don't think, I don't think so, no, but I was also- Where did, kind of I, sort where of did I get cut off, Thomas? You know? uh, I would be very grateful if someone from the audience could tell me, <laughs> to be honest with you. The um, Uber bike man. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're returning to the putting out system. So it, was the, it was the motor, it was the motor you got kicked off at, apparently. Great. Okay, so the, we are all, we are all motors, uh, as far as capital is concerned, as me with my computer, um, as faulty as it may be. Um, but the assumption is that I'll have one, right? They didn't like, uh, we'll send a, uh, a camera crew to your house to do this uh, chat. Of course not. Uh, everyone's got a computer. Um, and so I was talking about Karl Marx talks about the putting out system a little bit where production is outsourced into individuals' homes. And we writes about this a little bit, but doesn't think it's very important basically, and we can understand why, is that at the time, capital was reaping huge efficiencies from centralizing production within factories. And so Marx gives the watch making industry as a counter example, because you know, the pieces are so small and it's so valuable and it's such skilled labor and you don't have to bring them very far and you don't really make that many. And so for, that, for those reasons, you know, let those artisans work at home, they'll be happier, they'll be more productive. But in general, he just saw these huge efficiencies from the centralization of production that it didn't really make sense for him in the future to be seeing capital uh, have us producing back in our homes. And so this question of training costs didn't seem particularly relevant uh, to what he was writing about. And I think this is the, the like only time you can make that joke about Karl Marx did not anticipate the coming of the internet because that's what this, this joke's about is that the computers are able to reduce these, these distances and make the decentralization of production economical again. 
And I don't just mean the internet, because you see this happening at the beginning, the birth of computers, right? One of the first things you have code doing, mini code, is obviating the need for full circuit paths. So instead of laying out all these circuits, they say, well, we can simulate the path of uh, electricity through these circuits through code. And so you see code is collapsing distances. You see them using uh, laser, laser beam communication between buildings at the beginning of computers at like Xerox PARC in order to, to print when they had their printer was too big to move to the office. They said, okay, we'll just connect it with a laser beam. Um, and so capital is making this, is collapsing these distances. But also in like way less glamorous ways. So uh, a lot of my research right now is about this uh, birth of the computer industry. And something I didn't realize till now is that in the early 2000s, you still, you have uh, home-based production of microchips within Silicon Valley. You have families um, in their houses with pots of solvent, industrial solvents boiling on their stove, putting together motherboards in their homes in the Silicon Valley. And there's this great quote from uh, some semiconductor boss saying like, you know, when we've got them in here in the factory and we tell them we need a hundred chips, they can't do it. They don't, it's not possible. But when we send them home and we say we need a hundred chips tomorrow, they come up with the chips. And he doesn't want to know what's going on in people's houses to create this like magic extra productivity. Um, but we know that it's the family mode of production, that they're incorporating other people, that they're risking their health. Um, that they're taking on all of these costs, that they're paying the gas bill for their stove, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we see this decentralization of production that makes this question of fixed variable capital much more important. You see the shift towards fixed variable capital because capital can afford to decentralize. And once they can start afford to decentralize production, then you can use this vector of exploitation by making workers pay for all of this stuff, you know, shifting these costs, not just of training, but of the actual means of production uh, onto the workers themselves. Yeah, and like I said, as long as they're protected from liability, capital could care less how you're producing, what you're producing, as long as you're producing enough. And so they set the, the rates, production targets, such that you have to be able to produce uh, whatever at the rate they need. And then at that point, it doesn't matter whether you're Edward Scissorhands or you're you know, Rumpelstiltskin or whatever, you're, you're getting it from wherever you need it. It doesn't matter to them as long as you're, you're producing at the level of output that you're producing and anything that you might need to do that as far as they're concerned is, is all lumped into you. And you're, you're still the motor you're still Edward Scissorhands. Uh, you don't own the means of production as far as capital is concerned. You are the means of production. And labor and human capital are just certain parts of that clump of means of production that capital requires. Um, yeah, that's key. All right, so now we can talk about what this allows us, other avenues that fixed variable capital allows us to think about. And so now I'm going to go back to my slide. Back to our motor. Our buddy, the motor. Um, OK, so what are the implications of all this stuff? This is a, a screen from the movie Upgrade, which if you haven't seen it, really great, totally worth checking out. Um, our, our protagonist right now has had his body uh, rebuilt by artificial intelligence that has now turned him into a weapon that the artificial intelligence is using, and he's now being upgraded via computer. Um, but what I'm using this to illustrate is that once now we're, we're transferring fixed costs onto the worker, one of the things that allows capital to do is shift the cost of upgrades onto the worker. Uh, because as equipment gets more sophisticated faster, this presents a real problem for capital that has to keep paying for upgraded equipment. Well, if you can shift this cost of constant upgrades onto your workers themselves, whether that's by them constantly having to feel the need to upgrade their own skills 
or to buy their own iPhones, uh, that's savings for you, right? If, if companies had to constantly buy all of their workers new smartphones, that would be a real, real cost to them, but they don't. Uh -huh. This is a, a quote from volume three, where Marx is talking about the counter tendencies to the rate of profit to declines, like the most part, important part in the whole collection. And I just find this is hilarious because he's like, oh, there's this thing where you might pay people below the value of uh, labor. This is, is crucial to the whole thing that we're doing here, but I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. Uh, but it's something that we need to think about. And so this depression of wages below the value of labor power, I think this is what is called underemployment, right? Not just like not getting enough hours, but the depression of wages below the value of labor power. And here, the way I'm using labor, labor power doesn't just mean your weight, the wages that you get as a worker that is the cost to reproduce yourself. It's also including all the stuff now that you're bringing to the site of production. And so if you're requiring workers to buy their own cars, suddenly depressing their wages below the value of their labor power is a lot easier once you're counting the car as part of their labor power. And this is something you can illustrate easily and dramatically with Uber drivers, which is that the, the latest driver survey has them paid gross, this is what they take home, not taking out taxes, uh, 83 cents a mile gross pay. Right now, the imbursement rate for the federal government, if you're a federal employee and you're using your car for, a, for work travel, so that's a, a rate that's been negotiated by unions. This is a realistic cost to a worker of what it takes to use your own car for work. Uh, if, is 57 and a half cents a mile. And so the margin of what workers are taking home there is so small, 83 cents a mile, we're already talking about less than $15 an hour. And so when we're talking about three quarters of that or so being compensation for your car for the, the fixed variable capital that you're bringing to, to work, you're not really getting paid anything there or you're getting paid very little below the cost of your labor power. And one of the consequences of depressing wages below the value of labor power is that workers find ways to, on their own to become more productive. They take it on themselves to say, okay, well, I'm going to reverse engineer this algorithm and figure out the most productive way I can engage with it. I'm gonna constantly thinking about how I can be a more useful Uber driver because I have to, because otherwise I won't be able to make enough money to reproduce myself. That's how you increase exploitation and that's how you keep profits going uh, at a time when profits are threatened. Another thing this helps explain in that same chapter, which is really essential, essential reading in volume three, um, where he's talking about counter tendencies. One of the other counter tendencies that Marx talks about is increasing wage labor from women and children. And with women, he's totally correct. Like that's exactly what happens. That's a huge uh, way that they've maintained profitability. But with children, it seems totally wrong that we've seen this collapse of children's wage work um, of teens who are working even before the recession in ways that don't seem aligned with the recession even. Um, and what anyone who studies teens and which I've done in the past will tell you is that this is because returns to work are falling, kids are getting pushed out of the labor market, which is extraordinarily tight. You know, we know those things. But the bigger issue is that the returns of education are so much higher. They're much better off spending their summertime uh, improving their resume or learning new skills than they would be working for $12 an hour at a job. Um, the, the, the returns of education are long-term so worth so much more both to them and as it seems now to capital to the economy. And so we can understand their work even if it's not waged um, as still productive, right? As still productive of human capital. And when we think about it that way, we can see that kids work really has increased, right? Where they definitely do spend a lot more time 
improving their own human capital. I, I think everyone knows that. That's what my whole first book is about, but uh, I think most people know it empirically as well. <clears throat> what this also means is that, oh, do I, um, okay. constantly worried I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose you guys. Um, this is a great quote from Selma James um, in Women in the Subversion of the Community, where she's talking about kids and school. She says, the rule of capital through the wage compels every and ultimately profitable to the expansion and extension of the rule of capital. That fundamentally is the meaning of school. And so this is Selma James pointing to unwaged labor. This is in her discussion of unwaged labor, right? And she's pointing to the unwaged labor of children as producing human capital, not just like reproducing themselves as kids or as future workers or whatever, but as building something that will be not immediately but ultimately profitable to capital. Um, and I've always thought it's really cool that she talks about it, kids' uncompensated labor in this way. And it's never really discussed as part of this text. And I always like to try and bring this out. But I think this also helps us clarify a distinction between reproductive and productive labor is that we can break them down on that sort of fixed and fluid binary, right? That the reproductive labor involves the, the reproduction of fluid elements of capital, right? You need like food and water and to be taken care of and medicine. That's on the getting used up by the day, right? That's reproductive work. But then we can recognize the production of human capital is a different kind of work that happens, that's accumulative over time, right? That doesn't get spent over time, over day, that is fixed. And so in that conception, this question of are teachers productive or unproductive work or non-productive workers, I think we can really come down and say teachers are productive workers, that what they're producing is human capital. Unfortunately, that also means that for teachers, students are equally productive workers because Marx is not an NCAA official. You can't say that like the coaches are workers, but the kids aren't, right? The guy yelling at you to run a lap is working, but the kid running the lap isn't working. Uh, that doesn't fly for real analysis. So congratulations to those of you who are teachers, you're now productive workers. Unfortunately, uh, you have a lot more coworkers than maybe you thought you did. Labor is also labor. Uh, this is a, the baby plus current prenatal education system, which I always love. It's like, what's better than a baby as a baby with a little bit of extra human capital. Um, but now we can understand, I guess a little ironically, reproductive labor, reproduction itself as productive labor, as the production of human capital and the production of workers. Um, It's reproductive, reproductive at the, but at the micro level, at the level of like giving birth to a child, that's productive labor, right? Uh, and we can think back to the Selma James a little bit that the, the feeling that she describes in Evinces is one of it as well. The capital is taking her child away from her out of the home, putting it in the school where it's being trained for capital. And that she experiences that as an exploit, exploitation, not just of her feelings, but also of her real work. Another question this suggests is, are there other kinds of fixed objects that you can exploit like machines um, without putting anything in in the first place? And Marx talks about soil as something that can be exploited in the same way that workers can be exploited, which suggests, I think, that the free gifts of nature aren't always so free as we've been led to believe. And, and this is a Dyson sphere, which is a speculative contraption that could surround a star and harvest the energy from it. And so we can, we can imagine someone using one of these to, for example, exploit the sun as a sort of fixed variable capital that is detached from labor, um, but that's still something that they can take advantage of for free. 
um, let's see if we can watch this video. This question of alienation and how can you be alienated from yourself? Let's watch this video and then talk about it. This is from the Born Identity. I'm making this up. These are real. Okay. Who has a sink in a plastic box full of money and six passports and a gun? Who has a bank account number in their hip? I come in here, and the first thing I'm doing is I'm catching the sidelines and looking for an exit. I see the exit sign, too. I'm not worried. I mean, you were shot. People do all kinds of weird and amazing stuff when they're scared. I can tell you the license plate numbers of all six cars outside. I can tell you that our waitress is left-handed and the guy sitting up at the counter weighs 215 pounds and knows how to handle himself. I know the best place to look for a gun is the cab of the gray truck outside. And at this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Now, why would I know that? How can I know that and not know who I am? Wow. I should this to a, a crowd um, some months ago and none of the young people like college students had ever heard of the Born Identity or any of the Born movies so I'm old um, but okay so the way Marx describes alienation is for the worker is you make this stuff and then the stuff that you make belongs to a capitalist who is oppressing you and so you encounter your own work as it's objectified as your enemy as this like force against this this outside estranged force that from which you're alienated that comes to attack you um, in the, that is made up of your own labor now how does that change when we start thinking of uh, a fixed product of our labor living still inside ourselves and i think this this born clip suggests that right is that you can have these skills and abilities that have been put inside of you by capital that you've worked perhaps even to put inside of you um, in order to in the future be exploited and you, you confront your own self as this product of your work that whose interests are counter to you um, and so alienation becomes a, a question of how you feel about yourself it becomes this question of self alienation because yourself itself is a product of your labor that is ultimately designed for your exploitation. Uh, and I think that speaks to a lot of the feelings that a lot of people are encountering right now about the kind of people that they've been made by capital. And this was literally like right before I started this conversation. This is like an hour and a half ago. Yeah, 2.15 today. The White House saying kids are essential workers, so they have to go back to school which sounds completely and totally wacko until you like do this conversation. And then we realize that of course, kids are essential workers. They're producing the human capital that capitalists are going to need to exploit down the road. And if they can't count on that human capital being there, then all of our equations for production are totally screwed. And so kids need to work at the school and go back and build their a little longer than I planned to, but hopefully there's still some people around who want to ask some questions. All right, thank you so much, Malcolm. I am also having a shitty internet day. Hopefully you all can hear me as I try and do stack and run some Q&A here. Okay, so um, the first question in the chat is from the DSA SF chapter. And they ask, how does the notion of surplus labor relate to human capital? What propels capital to disregard or exclude surplus labor versus exploit? Yeah, so how does, how does surplus value relate to human capital? That's a great question because what we're talking about is built up labor um, 
in the first place. And the, the, the neoliberal vision of what human capital is, is that you're like investing in yourself. Um, and we should, ne don't let them get away with that. Like, that's not true. What you're doing is working. Uh, and what you do through work is you're saving. <laughs> you save through work, right? You in invest capital, but you're not a capitalist. Like you're a worker. You invest, you don't invest in yourself. What you do is you accumulate labor. And so even when I bring my, when I bring my computer to work, that's not capital for me. That's capital for my boss, who is a capitalist. For me, that's a tool that I saved up for. That's my accumulated labor. And so when my boss gets value out of my computer, um, that's surplus value that he can find a way to extract from my computer, which is my past labor, right? So you can pull surplus value out of my past labor. Um, or not, or maybe I could get something out of him for it. Uh, but I think when you look at patterns of education and worker compensation, you can see how this relationship is actually turning out. And the way it's actually turning out is this is a vector of exploitation, right? They are harvesting surplus value from the labor you do as a child, uh, which is why that labor is itself alienating. That's why school feels so fucked up now for kids, I think, um, for students in general, and maybe for the teachers who are teaching them also, is because they realize that like, they're doing this because what they're doing is going to be exploited in the future. Um, and that feels bad. Okay, I have a lag. <laughs> so Hopefully I'm, I'm in a good position to do this. So Malcolm, are you ready for the next one? Yes. Okay. I can put it so, on my phone. Okay. This person would like to ask you if you think the adoption of remote learning through software, especially during the current pandemic, is leading to a new kind of centralization of human capital, or sorry, human capital production. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what skills are, what are, what are kids learning when they're learning through Zoom? I have a hard time believing that you know, a seven-year-old is learning a lot of substance via Zoom from what I've heard. Um, and the idea that that's like a more uh, enriching use of their time than any other thing that they could be doing sounds ridiculous to me. However, what I think they are learning is how to stay productive and you know, uninterrupted, how to continue on with their routine during a disaster. And that's going to be a very, very, very important capacity as we move on to the future. If you think about a seven-year-old, all right, well, what is, what is a current seven-year-old's prime working years? What's, what does the ecology look like 20 years from now? How many months of the year are you going to be able to, to go outside 40 years from now? Um, and so you think about the, the skills and abilities and, and training that kids are getting from this whole Zoom experiment. Uh, I think it's very useful stuff in a, in a bad way, right? This is training them for the future of production. It's not any good to them as people. There's no enrichment going on there. Um, and it seems like real, very pure human capital production to me. And it seems pretty clear what it is, what those skills are, are going to be useful for. So the next question is, um, how does race work in your theorization of human capital with regard to racial oppression and settler colonialism? That's a very, very good question. Uh, I am still working on it. So uh, labor market segmentation is clearly connected to the, the creation of race and the utilization of race uh, by capital, right? Um, is they separate jobs by workers and they create um, a sort of wa wages of whiteness uh, as, as one way it's been described, right? So it's like your whiteness is something that you bring to, to work, um, but exactly what the value of that is uh, to capital and how that gets included in production, I think is, is a very complicated question that we're going to have to try and figure out. Um, so the role of, of race in, in fixed variable capital, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to be end up thinking about that um, as a concept. It doesn't mean it's not 
that doesn't mean like race isn't deeply involved in the, the history and production and ongoing production of capital. I think there's a reason the, the motor progressive mascot is black, for an example, um, that the, the face of this sort of decentralized production that we're talking about uh, is black. And I think there's a, a reason for that um, because that's a, another way that capital fights for a, an increased rate of profit is paying people less. And one of the classic ways that they pay people less is la racial labor market segmentation. Um, so I think that's a reference we're, we're going to see here. Um, I guess that's how you can see them connected. Okay. So how does one start to organize and build consciousness around some of the physical free gifts of labor people bring to the workplace? I organize with Uber drivers and they rarely see their car rentals or payments as in the realm of advocacy, the way they do wages or algorithmic control. Yeah, well, I think the, the some groups doing gig worker organizing try to bring attention to this. Like I said, the, the stat about uh, how much workers are getting paid per mile and how much they're paying for their cars and stuff it, I got from a gig worker advocacy organization. So I think there's an awareness that that is cutting into their, their pay. And I think there's an understanding that this is a mode of exploitation. I think workers also understand that they are more and more qualified for their jobs that are not paying more and more. Um, and this is happening at all levels of the economy, right? Not just at the like elite levels of the economy, but uh, we've seen education, the education of the American population explode over the past half century and compensation hasn't been forthcoming. And a lot of those people who sort of bought into the idea of human capital and their investment in their future human capital are not uh, elites who already had that sort of constant relationship where I've got a family that can invest in my future ability, but people who put their accumulated past labor into their abilities, right? Who worked, not invested, but who worked for their skills. And capital has taken advantage of that work, that mass of work that so many people have done and has been able to pay people less for, the, for that. Um, All right, so could you, Malcolm, say a bit more about the relationship between underemployment, as you define it, and the production of human capital, fixed variable capital? That is, how does the work of human fixed variable capital work to push the wage below the value of labor? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the value of labor, to reiterate, because this is a, it's a really hard concept to, I think, uh, to grow, because like, what's the value of labor, right? It's like whatever you can get it. Well, the value of labor is, is by society. And it's like, you know, the average wage for your society. It's what you need to get by in your society as a, as a worker. That's, that's what the value of labor is. If you add up all the jobs and you divide them. Um, but what we need to include in that adding up all the jobs and dividing them is also all the things that you are, that workers are now compelled to bring. So not just their skills, but also their tools and whatever, uh, whatever cars or licenses or certifications that they've got to bring um, and divide it. And so the more, the more human capital or fixed variable capital that you're bringing to the table, that you're bringing to production as a worker, the more this value of labor goes up. And the more it goes up without you realizing it, the easier it is for them to push pay down below it. And so you can even, uh, push pay down below the value of labor without lowering wages if what you're doing is saying you have to, oh, well, next week you got to bring your own car to work. Or even if you're, let's say you're a worker, regular, you know, contract freelance worker or whatever, expected to have your own communications technology and your computer breaks. And you're like trying to do the math of like, okay, well, I've got this design job but it's only you know a thousand dollars for this job, and if I got to spend two thousand dollars on the computer, then and they're only going to pay me this, and then but I can't do it, and suddenly you're paying to work, um, and I think that's a, a phenomenon that people are more and more familiar with because it's this vector of increasing exploitation, because we're in a situation right now where profits are tight, right? You've got to look for somewhere where you can find uh, space as a, a capitalist to 
to sort of eke out that exploitation because there's not a lot of consumer demand out there. Like uh, we're in an overproduction crisis. And so any way you can find increasing margins of profitability, you got to go for it. And one way you can do that is pushing costs onto workers. And in terms of the value of labor, what that means is you're increasing the value of labor in a way that allows you to bring your uh, the pay below that, which is increasing the rate of exploitation, which is actually Marx is like number one in that section. Basically every point in that section is the same thing. Because the only way to increase profitability when it's profit crunch is to increase, a, increase exploitation one way or the other. Okay, so our next question is from Kelly. I think you have your webcam on. So do you want me to read your question or would you like me to unmute you? All right. Did that go? Hi, yeah. I also have a quick comment. Um, just, I don't know if you're aware that uh, Hertz Car Rental has a program with Lyft. Did mm -hmm. you? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that they have this whole set up. Um, but my question was um, something I was talking about with a friend of mine the other day, just a, oh, a way no. to train students um to accept doing unpaid labor or working overtime hours kind of against their will at their future job so i was just curious if you could comment on that and um considering that maybe many of us are grad students what that means for us if we're in teaching positions in terms of assigning homework and what the kind of what the consequences of that could be yeah absolutely and you can always do more homework right um and so opening up this space of uh, for increased work always starts this competitive race, which is something I didn't even really talk about here is then the competition between individuals to have the most, to be the, the most prepared, which capital makes huge use of. And so by when you introduce the, yes, homework teaches kids that uh, you can always work more, that you should be bringing work home, um, and that, that's normal to always be working, that there's no like work home division that's solid. But I think that that point has sort of been made for a while now. I think that's it's almost sort of uh, a like antiquated cliche point to be like, oh, the break, there's a breakdown between like the home and work. Um, and actually, I keep bringing things back to early computers because that's how I'm spending all my time now. Uh, but in like the, the 70s, early 70s, late 60s, Intel did this internal survey about what people could imagine using, using a, a personal computer for. What could they imagine using a computer at home for? Because at the time, computers were giant databases at work. And they surveyed the entire uh, company and they only got back one answer. And the only answer they got back was, uh, well, a housewife could organize her recipes using a home computer. Because the idea that you would like bring a computer home and do work at your house with a computer is like, that was so ridiculous. That's like telling a car mechanic, like, oh, why don't you bring like the car jack home and like, you know, work on the car in your living room uh, after hours. Like that's, that's obviously ridiculous. And I would never do that. And I would never like invent the machine that would allow me to do that because that would be stupid. Um, and now this seems like, well, of course, you just go home and do your work at home after work. Uh, and kids have definitely internalized that. In my first book, I talk about, there's this book from the 50s called Danny Dunn and the Homework Machine, which I think really <clears throat> captures exactly what you're talking about, which is this kid gets access to a mainframe computer in 1959 and is like, oh my God, I can do homework automatically now. I don't have to do homework. I can go play. And then I can do my friend's homework too. And we can all do homework. And the now we don't have to do homework anymore. And the teacher confronts them and is like, you can't do this, this is cheating. And he's like, no, it's not, it's using technology. It's using tools, what are you talking about? Everyone uses technology and tools to do their work. And the teacher's like, oh, damn, like, what am I gonna do? I can't keep this kid working anymore. And the, the answer that she comes up with, with Danny's mother, is just increase the workload. Just give them tons and tons and tons. Oh, congratulations, you're the like homework champions. Now you can have this much homework. And so now you still have to spend the same amount of time, but now it's on the computer and now you can produce that much more. 
and that's the conclusion. And the conclusion is like, oh, well, he'll have a better chance of getting into college now. Um, and he gets a shiny star, star sticker. And so, and that's what's happened, right? So that's what homework is. And computers are directly related to this birth of homework. Um, this like, you can work at, not just homework in the, in the kids sense, but homework in general, this, this permeability that is at this point, many decades long, and that these kids have never conceptualized. You know, if you think about how they're seeing work, the world of work that they're seeing is not like mom stays at home and dad goes to work at nine and comes back at five or whatever. Uh, that's not the, the world of work that kids are experiencing these days. And so, uh, yeah, I don't think it's even homework that's training them on that anymore. Like that's, that's, that might've been in the sixties, that's what trained them. But now, now uh, kids are ready to work 24 seven and they understand their job is like to work 24 seven in a way that not even I felt like I did, um, which is disturbing. Does that answer? Oh. All right, so Malcolm, we actually have quite a few more questions. So oh, how are you for time? Do we need to stop anywhere? Yeah. Are you still having fun? <laughs> yeah, fuck it, all right, keep them coming, let's go. Okay, I'm gonna go to our uh, wild cat in the field here, Tony. A favorite FUC participant. Okay, you should be unmuted. Good. Oh, hey, uh, th thanks for, um, thanks for Malcolm, it's great. Uh, thanks for keeping having fun. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to ask um, if uh, you think there are ways to leverage these arguments. So, you know, we fought the struggle for COLA over the last year um, as grad student workers. Um, and so kind of through the struggle, uh, we were mainly leveraging the argument that we were, we were workers. Um, we work too long, we don't get paid enough, um, you know, we go over hours, all of this. And then sometimes we made the argument that we were students producing research as, and that was work. Mm -hmm. We didn't really make the argument that just like, our study was work that deserves to be compensated. So the kind of argument that kids in schools are essential workers, like, um, you know, just by virtue of producing human capital, we didn't really do that. Um, but that argument allows you to then make the argument that undergrads should, uh, should uh, you know, get free tuition and even wages for- And get paid, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering if, how to conceptualize that to, uh, to, to you know, make our fight. It's hard, right? Because on the one hand, you want to be like, you need us to teach your kids STEM. And if like, and if you don't have us teaching your kids STEM, then like, you're fucked and like China's gonna invade and you're all gonna die. And <laughs> party wants to make this like Cold War argument that like, this is a national security question. Like if you don't pay us enough, then we're not gonna train enough scientists. And then as a country, we're screwed. At the same time, like that's a bad, like that's a bad argument in some ways in that it relies on this question of like international competition, implicitly it's anti-immigrant because the answer could just be like, oh, we'll just bring in smart people to teach those classes from India or anywhere else. Um, at which point you have to say like, no, we'll keep them out or something. Um, and you don't want to, at the same time that you're fighting for the, why you're necessary workers, reduce your value to this like cog in a human capital production machine. Because it might be true, but it's bad. And you want to be like, uh, you need us to stultify your children, um, even if they do need you to stultify their children in certain ways. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how those work. Maybe it's like a more useful argument to make behind closed doors, because I'm sure it's one that they take seriously um, at a certain level that like, but at the same time, that's also a question of uh, these bargaining units, right? And I was at, I was in Cambridge when they were voting uh, at Harvard on a, a union and a strike at the same time, if I recall correctly. And they were, the, the STEM graduate students were really skittish and they didn't want to do it both because they got paid a lot better in general. Like the, the, the school sort of understands that already and they're already compensating based on this understanding of, well, we know what human capital is useful for us and which one isn't. Um, 
and they were threatening them with all this really particular stuff. They're like, oh, your experiments will be destroyed if you go on a strike, like, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there is a risk if you say, well, our value is that we're producing the human capital. And then they say, well, great, then we don't need like all this art shit over here, then do we? Um, so, which they, they're already doing anyway. So there, there are a lot of dangers into playing into their discourse, which is ultimately what the human capital discourse is because it's from the perspective of capital. Uh, and how labor can intervene then is, is sort of before you become human capital, right? Before you're put back, put, put to work, which is in the place of wage negotiations, which is what, where you are, right? That's where you're saying like, well, you, we're not your human capital yet. You gotta, you gotta buy it first. And we're in a place where you can't count us, count us or count on us until uh, you pay up. And that's the leverage that you've got is that you actually are essential, that it's, that it's true, right? You don't need to say it because it's factual. Um, yeah, and I, think that's, and I think that's true. So I, no, I say stick with, the, with what you're doing now. Okay, so I guess we have a comment in response to Tony's question, yeah. um, which is, wouldn't the argument also point to the postgraduate school life of precarious academic labor? And I can also unmute the person who added that comment if they want to join in. Yeah, let's expand on it. I'm just going to improvise. Okay. All right, thanks, Malcolm. And thanks, Tony, as well. I, I guess. Um, <clears throat> So much of the anti-grad labor hinges on this um, technical distinction between student and worker, um, but this mm -hmm. seems like a good leverage point at which you can eliminate that category distinction, right, by, by pointing out that actually, no, we're building the fixed variable capital that you are eagerly awaiting to exploit once we're out of here, right? <clears throat> and so you should pay us more now because, I mean, you don't want to say it, but because you're going to want to try and pay us less later. <laughs> Right, right. With that, that would be a sort of another hinge point. So, to challenge the idea of the graduate student as ever having any distinction with the graduate worker, that, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, well, I think grad organizing has sort of made a good point of this so far of, of drawing this connection between. Um, the skills and the, the money and the time that you put in to develop these abilities and pay that doesn't reflect that. And that, that itself is a mode of exploitation that, that you, if you underemploy someone by not recognizing that you have to pay for all of these uh, rare skills that they have, that they've spent all this time developing, um, that that's a mode of exploitation. And I think people are, are feeling that, especially because there are so many We've seen this increase in rates of education, right? There are more people getting more education. Um, and so there are more people who can have more that they feel like they've, they're have they being exploited for and they're correct. Um, so I think that'll be, as more people can recognize these arguments because they experience them and it reflects their experiences, uh, I think they become more resonant popularly. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Okay, so our next question is sort of building off of that. And um, I have asked the question asker whether this is more for K-12 or higher ed, but it may sort of apply to both. Um, what would resistance to the exploitation of students' work look like from their perspective if their human capital is being built up for later realization, a surplus value? What leverage might they have at labor stage? And given the fact that teachers are the ones ensuring they cultivate human capital through their labor. Are teachers the coworkers of students, or are they their managers? Ah, well, uh, your managers are also your coworkers, right? Uh, that's the problem with I call I call it middle man managers, and they get really mad at me. Uh, but it's like it's literally true, and I think it's experientially true once you have classroom disputes on those grounds which almost never happens these days, I feel like, but it's something that I encourage and every grad student here is gonna hate me and hope there are no undergrads listening. Um, 
But something I love doing as an undergrad, I've never been a grad student, so I've never experienced it from the other side, but something I like doing as an undergrad is negotiating on syllabus day, which is what they hand out the syllabus and you say, yeah, that sounds, sounds a little heavy. What if we cut back these three responses and we only had four responses instead of seven? And you just raise your hand and you say that. And they look at you like, you're not like, what? And then other kids are like, yeah, you know, that does seem like a lot. We could do four instead of seven. And most teachers, most instructors, and most instructors are, as you know, uh, not professors, um, are pretty open to this and tend to be pretty receptive and don't just like freak out um, about their like control of the situation. I think partly because it's day one and they don't want to set a bad precedent and they're like, off their balance or whatever. But especially if you like know somebody in your class and you get like two or three students going into the class um, with a plan, you can totally rearrange a syllabus for a class like very quickly by negotiating and by treating your instructor as a coworker and by thinking of yourself as their coworker and thinking about what your interests are. And I don't mean like cutting back, you know, how much you might want to learn from a, a good class that you want to learn from, but there's a certain amount of just, uh, of stuff that's just hostile, right? That's a uh, measurement and busy work or whatever in most classes. Um, and you can, you should reduce your workload. You should organize to reduce your workload in the classroom. Uh, absolutely. Or even like change the, the syllabus if you think the readings are all biased or whatever, you're like, these are all dudes. How come they're all dudes on the syllabus? Um, you can do stuff like that and students should. It's, it makes you feel powerful. And I think that's actually better education for the workplace than like any other thing you could get, right? And that's, all, that's another thing that I think is so funny that if the point of school was to teach kids how to get good jobs, well, then you teach them like the importance of joining a union. You teach them how collective bargaining works. You teach them all the things they need to advocate for themselves as workers if you wanted them to get good jobs. But the point isn't for them to get good jobs, it's to build human capital, which may or may not involve them in particular getting a good job. They might be the person who never gets the good job, and yet they're still doing a, a useful thing for the economy by raising the level of competition. Uh, so students can lower the level of competition unilaterally if they want to. I would suggest it. There's sort I'm of sure there are ways graduate students can do that too. There's sort of an interesting bit of advice that circulates in my department, which is that a, a syllabus is not a contract, um, which mm. is a good thing to sort of get yourself out from under, but maybe for a slightly different reason in that, you know, you don't want to feel like as though you are providing or furnishing a product that your student has paid for via their tuition right. and therefore are sort of, they are entitled to receive things in a certain way. A's. Mm -hmm. so. This is also... Well, Slightly also gets a oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna... oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Thomas. I keep stepping on you. Go ahead. I was just gonna take a massive shit on like teacher evaluation things. That was it, really. In the, the kind of you know the kind of propagation of the um, student consumer thing, but that was all for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think creating an environment where it's clear everyone's coworkers, where you identify students as your coworkers, uh, gets out from under that a little bit, is that then you, you seem less like they're like, uh, that you're providing a product for them so much as that you are all collectively working towards some like end whatever in the classroom. Okay, so we have two more questions in the chat left. Does that sound? All right, let's, let's cut it off there. Let's just cut it, let's okay. Continue. Stack is closed. Stack right. is closed. Stack is closed. All right, so penultimate question. Um, this is sort of going back to the prior question about race and racialization. Um, so do prisons offer a good point of analysis, i.e. naturalization of racialized subjects as subjects without rights, expected to not only produce cheap labor, but also to pay back the costs they incurred as prisoners, food, etc.? Um, well, prisoners are slaves. 
and they're they're legally slaves in the United States, and so we should we should understand prison prison workers as as enslaved people, um, and so that is that is a different spin on human capital and what human capital means because when we've been talking so far we've been talking about free labor free laborers, um, and free labor is, is one labor regime. It's theoretically the dominant labor regime right now but it coexists with a number of other labor regimes at all times in capital. Um, and prison slavery is one of them that exists in the United States right now. And so if you think about how, how do we think about uh, prisoners as human capital? Well, look at the state of California, for example, that worried that they can't start decarcerating too many people because you need enough firefighters to fight the fires. And we use the, uh, prisoners to fight fires at below labor value costs, right? Um, so we, we exploit prisoners uh, because they have no rights because they are owned by the state functionally um, to do work that otherwise workers would not do or that you'd have to pay people more to do. And so yeah, they're, they're lowering the wage rate and you're increasing the rate of exploitation by yes, exploiting like slave labor at the same time. Um, and yes, that, that absolutely has to do with labor market segmentation by race in that one of the ways we've excluded people from this domain of free labor um, has been in this country and throughout the world through race and racialization um, to, to the degree that you can think about uh, like free labor as a, a white relation to labor in the history of the United States um, and not as the dominant relationship to labor that many other groups of people have. Um, so yeah, I think then, I mean, then you get into the Marx only uses the phrase human capital twice in his entire corpus and both times he's talking about slavery. Um, and so you can draw the history of, of human capital back, I think, to some people draw it to like turn of the century imperial, nascent imperial Germany, which looks at the free market and says like, oh, we gotta do better than this. We gotta like think of our population as a resource, um, which I think is, is a valid way to look at it. But I think I would look back further than that to there's a letter between George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, where they say that the birth of black children in the state of Virginia increases the state's human capital stock by 4% a year. And I think you can, you can draw the history of human capital to that letter and to this understanding of speculative investment in future of human labor embodied in people um, to that, yeah, to that letter. And so, yeah, I think the, the, the history of human capital is deeply related to the history of slavery in the United States that continues in the form of the prison. Thumbs up, thumbs down to that. All right, so our last question um, is about your first book in which you describe college admissions offices as the bond rating agencies for kids. How significant of a role would you assign to the college admissions competition in producing human capital? Um, well, it's definitely a, a, a race, right? That's a I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate it because it's such a small percentage of kids that even are involved in the the application for competitive colleges, and it's true that with the like value of human capital, or whatever our our economy has concentrated on what they think of as hyperproductive workers um, who are driven to these heights of hyperproductive productivity through, uh, uh, as children, a lot along this question of college admissions. So it's there, yeah. At the same time, like most of the people who go, the vast majority of people who go to college don't go to competitive colleges. They're not applying to competitive colleges. The, the question of human capital for the country is a question that far exceeds the population of Americans that attend competitive colleges. And it has to do with people who get associate's degrees. Like that's, that's where we've seen this huge bulking of human capital in the United States is more and more people attending some levels of higher education. Um, so I don't want to exaggerate it. It's a big thing. I think I, I, I use it 
in my first book because I think narratively it's really useful to think about uh, kids and this end of childhood and um, then compiling this sort of resume and thinking about all of their work as kids uh, as part of this resume compilation or whatever. But I also talk about how human capital works in different ways for different kids based on where capital thinks you're going to be useful to capital. And so if some kids learn to be adventurous thinkers and to always shout out an answer, some other kids are learning to shit up, sit down, shut up and be quiet and do what they're told. Um, and both of those are job skills. They're just for different kinds of jobs. And like we're talking about with racialization and labor market segmentation, school is a big place where that happens, right? We see like laning and tracking earlier. Earlier and earlier, they're dividing kids on this path. And I think part of that has to do with the heavier costs that capital is investing in human capital. You got to decide earlier and earlier which kids are worth investing in and which kids aren't. And of course, those are going to be the arbitrary decisions because I don't think people have like unitary intelligence measures, never mind potential measures or anything like that. Uh, our worths cannot be measured or compared. Um, and so they're going to follow existing inequalities and, and increase them. And I think that's what we've seen around, definitely around college admissions for sure. Uh, as well as some of them just bribing their way around it, which I think was really revealing when we saw people paying, you know, I'll pay you a million dollars to make it look like my kid tried really hard through their, their childhood. Well, now we know what trying really hard through your childhood is worth, I guess, it's worth a million dollars. So that's a lot of work that those kids are doing um, if that's what it sells for on the market too bad they can't just uh, swap it because they'd be way better off, I think. Go to public school and swap your college, your Harvard admission for a million dollars. That'd be a good deal. Unfortunately, it is inalienable except through work. So I guess you're going to have to go to work after all. The end. Thank you all so much for having me. Please uh, pay onto the, the strike if you're still on this after like an hour and a half or whatever, then definitely click the link below this video and, and donate to this right fund.